Hello everyone, this is Balkwell, or Balkwell's Books, and welcome to another mini-episode of Balkwell's Books. Today, I would like to introduce you to a man who is one of my favorite non-fiction writers recently, and who wrote a book I, I recently finished called Technics and Civilization, uh, and this man's name uh, you may find is Lewis Mumford. Now, Lewis Mumford in Technics and Civilization is attempting to understand the last thousand years or so of technological process and the ways these technolo technology or technics, uh, technics being the sort of integration of technology with, with human life, the way these have affected uh, the ways that we live, the, the systems under which we live, and vice versa, the ways in which these systems uh, necessitate or create a necessity for certain technologies. And this interdevelopment uh, over a sort of historical process is the idea of the book. Uh, now, Lewis Mumford... It's a very interesting individual, not not particularly well known nowadays. I feel like he's he's overshadowed by many other twentieth century thinkers. This book was written in the thirties. Uh, it's one of his earlier works, in fact. Um, he began writing in the twenties when he was in his twenties, born in eighteen ninety five, uh, and then his career lasted until the nineteen seventies. I've only really read his earlier work thus far, um, but I think this book itself makes a compelling case for itself, even if later he, he makes even better books. Uh, I still think this one is quite worth reading. Now, Lewis Mumford, I think the it, it, it was interesting to look at the books he wrote prior to this to get an idea of sort of where he's coming from. Because Lewis Mumford, he's not an economist, and he's only partially a historian. Um, but he has certain predilections, certain ideas that uh, he's trying to develop that leads him to this book that you can see in the books prior. Now, the way I found out about Lewis Mumford is that he wrote a book about Herman Melville, which is called Herman Melville. And uh, it's a biography and a literary analysis uh, all in one. And I thought his, his his thoughts on Melville, his appreciation for Herman Melville, actually carries through in this book. He actually quotes Herman Melville in the book Technics and Civilization, which you don't see many people uh, doing, I think, in, in books of this sort. You can see the romanticism of Melville, the reaction against certain uh, types of regimentation, against certain types of labor systems that you can see in Herman Melville's work. Um, it, it certainly comes through uh, in Lewis Mumford as well, I believe. Another interesting book, his first published book, is the story of utopias. And in that book, he takes a look at a series of utopias, um, or utopian writings across history, beginning with Plato's Republic, and uh, takes a look at how these are related to the historical time in which they're written, and what the sort of preoccupations of the writers were, and how these utopias might succeed or fail, uh, or what they're, not how they might realistically succeed or fail, but theoretically what are their successes, what are their failures, and how do they reflect the failures of the time period in which they were, they were written. And some utopias, um, instead of correcting what he perceives as the problems of historical period actually only exacerbate them because 
the writer can't pull themselves out of their time and see uh, the sort of contradictions or the ways in which the systems under which they live are diminishing the ability of humans to thrive. And this is the main concern of Lewis Mumford, is human thriving and living a good life. I was reading a biography about Lewis Mumford recently. I don't remember who wrote it, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, put it in the notes, I think. And um, it does seem that even from a very early age, one of his primary concerns was becoming a good man, a good person, living a good life. And what he seems to mean by this is not just being a kind and, and, and generous person, although that, that's obviously part of it. What, what he means is developing an understanding, you know, being well-read, understanding the world around you and, and the problems um, that are affecting the people, the sort of inherent problems in the systems that have been developed, and working to uh, change them. Uh, in such a way that all people can live a sort of glorious uh, and balanced, well-balanced life. So it's not just about material needs, although, you know, having your material needs fulfilled in a secure fashion where you're not living meal to meal or you don't have to worry about, you know, what's coming next is part of it. You know, it's very important for living a good life to have uh, that security, but also the the leisure and the capacity to uh, engage in the finer activities of appreciating culture, cultural uh, products, I guess you could say, you know, enjoying music, reading nice books, and uh, such forth, appreciating poetry, not in a sort of uh, maybe aristocratic sense of, you know, everybody's got to have time to sit around and read Homer or whatever. But, you know, everyone likes art. You know, everyone likes listening to music and, and, and appreciating, you know, movies and things like this. And having the time to um, not only engage with them as a way of sort of wasting time or using time, but having them actually contribute to uh, your sort of development. And also living in a sort of, uh, with a relationship to nature, you know, having trees around, having animals around, feeling like one is connected to nature. And all of this is a reaction to the extreme sort of industrial uh, excesses, industrial and, and for financial excesses of the late 19th early 20th century. He's writing this book in the 1930s. Um, so there's a lot of nonsense that, that has been going on. And uh, the world is in a pretty dire situation uh, in many ways, in political uh, ways and in, in cultural ways. And, you know, there's all sorts of uh, dire, direness uh, abound in, in the world that he lives in. And so what Lewis Mumford is trying to do is, is take a look at uh, how did we get here? You know, how did I get here? And um, how do we get out of here? You know, and not just how do we, you know, destroy it all and, and do something else and not you know, importantly also not how do we get back to some past, but how do we take what we've developed, the technology and the systems that we've developed and modify them, develop them in such a way that we can carry on the good things that have come from technology um, while mitigating these sort of disastrous uh, circumstances or, or consequences that come from using this technology in silly ways, destructive ways, and... Um, ways that simply don't make any sense. I think Lewis Mumford works as a very nice sort of counterpart or complement to Karl Marx. And the reason for this is that 
they they come to similar conclusions. I mean, obviously Lewis Mumford read Marx and and you know gained a lot from that. I think Karl Marx, you know, he he's not that fun to read for a lot of people, and there's a good reason for that. What Karl Marx was trying to do is sort of develop political economy uh, in a way that actually made any amount of sense. Now, economics sometimes because sometimes feels very grounded. You know, we might think of economics as a very grounded sort of science because when we look at the news and they say the economy is this way and the economy is that way, you know, it affects the daily life of, of everyone. You know, uh, economy is bad means you lose your job and you don't have any money and food costs too much and all this sort of thing. And so it can feel like econ- economics would be a very uh, grounded field of scientific research. But in fact, economics has a tendency to become uh, ridiculously abstract and invent invent a world, a conceptual world, and then try to fit our world into it. And that's what Marx was seeing in the political economy of his day. I mean, I'm using those two terms. It was called political economy back then. Now it's just called economics. Don't ask me why, man. Just... That's just how it is. But anyway, he looked at the political economy, the so-called vulgar economists of his day, and saw that um, a lot of what they were doing was sort of apologia for uh, capitalism, the the sort of um, not just inequalities, but the inconsistencies, the contradictions within capitalism and the, the strange ways that it worked. And they were trying to explain it uh, and make it seem rational. What he chose instead to do is sort of take their uh, field, take the economic terms, the the um, models that they have developed for economics, and twist it in such a way that it actually describes what is what is happening on Earth in real life, the actual relationships between labor, uh, laborers and capitalists, or labor and capital in, in general. And to explain how these relationships came about, that they're not just natural relationships, but that they developed out of the economic system prior, the, the feudal system. And um, the I'm struggling to explain this very well. Anyway, what, what I'm trying to get at is that Marx embedded himself deep within uh, the enemy, the enemy headquarters, he got deep into the political, uh, economy and, you know, political, political economy is interesting, but it's, it's not, you know, great to read. And also what Lewis Mumford recognizes and what I think most people, you know, intuitively understand is that economics is just one part of human life, the human world. You know, it's not the, you know, big thing. It's not the whole thing. You can't explain the whole world and the whole human life using economics. You know, it's just one factor. And so Lewis Mumford, instead of um, discussing economics for economics' sake or something like this, um, instead... Uh, takes a bit of a more zoomed out approach, looks at it from a human perspective, you know, what does this do for a human life, or for human life in general, human thriving, and how does it uh, cooperate with these other aspects of civilization, these cultural aspects, and art, and such forth, and social social relations, and things like this. Me. Although Mumford's not really as concerned with social relations as he is with the, the individual thriving, and I, it does seem like to him, if the individuals are allowed to thrive, the social conditions will change likewise, uh, which might be a, a misguided notion on his part, 
but uh, that's the way he looks at it. So I believe that serves as an introduction. Uh, I believe it serves as an introduction, though you may believe otherwise. Uh, I'd just like to take a brief moment, which who knows how brief this moment will be really, uh, to discuss the three eras that Lewis Mumford uh, splits modern technological development into, what he considers to be the main characteristics of these eras, and what he sees for the future. Uh, I think it's interesting reading um, books from, you know, this is, about, this is almost 100 years old, this book. But what's interesting about reading books um, that discuss historical trends that are old, relatively, is that you can see the ways that this book fits into the historical trend and where the trend goes afterwards. Books written now, and this isn't a knock against them, this is just a fact of, of time, I guess, is that books now, it almost feels like when you read a book that ends in the right now, that now is the end of time, you know, that things have come to this point and everything was working towards this point, and now we're here and... Uh, most of the time the conclusion is uh, we're totally screwed, you know. But what's interesting is, you know, you can see Mumford is at a particular point in this trend and you can see it coming towards him. He describes it approaching him and then he describes where he thinks it'll go after and maybe it went there, maybe it went over here. You know, it's sort of, there are certain aspects of the trends that he very accurately foresees and then there are aspects that maybe he's a little bit too optimistic about. I don't think he's optimistic. I think he's trying to find the, the, the best case scenario so that maybe we can pursue it. And uh, let me tell you, uh, we did not do that, but uh, we, there's, still, there's still time, I suppose. Anyway, the book begins... In the first of the three eras that Lewis Mumford describes, and I will name them, these are the Eolithic era, the Paleolithic era, and the Neolithic era. Uh, i just like to mention, I, I say Eolithic, Paleolithic, and Neolithic. I mean Eotechnic, Paleotechnic, and Neotechnic. I guess when I wrote down my notes, I just used the words that occurred in my head, which are those ones which are more common. It's not lithic, it's technic. Eotechnic, paleotechnic, neotechnic. This is really important because they don't correlate to the, you know, paleolithic time era or anything like that. It's technics. So sorry for me being kind of a dumbo wumbo in that respect. Now, the Eolithic is, is the longest. It basically begins in the 10th, 11th century. It's not entirely clear. I mean, these divisions are obviously going to be very uh, fuzzy. But the predominant... So each era has a predominant energy source and a sort of, let's say, technological system or a structural system that governs how things are going to be done. And they also contain the roots, of course, of the system that's going to come later. And we see this in the Eolithic period. Now, the Eolithic period, the primary energy sources, aside from human energy, obviously, which is going to be the main one, is water power and wind power. You know, you've got water mills for um, milling grain and other sort of things. You can get a lot of power from, from running water. And then the development of windmills in places where it's windy. Now, obviously, there are 
many nice things about water and wind power. As people have begun to realize in the 20th century, uh, one of the nice things is that they're uh, essentially free. I mean, obviously you have to build and maintain the infrastructure to capture the energy, but the energy is already there, and there's, there's no waste uh, involved in the actual uh, transfer of energy. I mean, there's waste of potential energy, maybe, if you're a physicist, but there's no, like, freaking ooze, you know, coming out of the back of a, of a water mill. And the downside, obviously, is that you can only have them near water or in a place where it's very windy, and specifically wind is, is quite inconsistent. Uh, you don't know when you're going to get wind and when you're not going to get wind. Sometimes it's windy, sometimes it's not. I guess you could you'd probably predict it decently nowadays relative to how they could then, but it's still, you know, you can't have uh, the level of production that is possible with later technology. And aside from these energy sources, what Lewis Mumford focuses on as a key invention in the Eolithic period is the mechanical clock. And because the mechanical clock allows for many other things that come later, particularly regimentation. Regimentation being important uh, for the modern military machine, uh, which is one of the many machines, but also important for uh, factory production. And uh, I don't want to get into the clock too much. I wrote an essay about clocks that's coming out soon. So I'll talk about clocks there, and I reference this book then. So clocks. Just know, you know, clocks, time, it's important stuff. Uh, the Paleolithic period, which is basically the period of the Industrial Revolution and the development of capitalist production, is probably the, the main crux. You know, the Eolithic period exists almost as a uh, foil, I suppose, for the Paleolithic period, and the main uh, focus of the book, I believe, is the Paleo Paleolithic period. So the main energy sources here become coal, uh, because coal can be used to... Uh, Wow, I just lost that sentence completely. <laughs> because coal can be used in a steam engine or to power a steam engine. And the steam engine is, is very important for um, moving things. <laughs> you know, a, what a steam engine can do is that it can move very big things. You know, it has a very high amount of horsepower and it can move very big things and is necessary for you to have a factory. But what's important here, before we even get to that, with coal and, and other such things, is that mining is the most important industry for the Paleolithic period. You need to go underground and you need to get stuff. And this is very important for Lewis Mumford. You need to get coal from underground, obviously, and you also need to get metals, um, which are used to create the modern machine, the modern factory. In the Eolithic period, things are made out of wood, and very rarely out of metals. But it's hard to get metals, and so primarily things are made out of wood. In the Paleolithic period, everything is made of metals because of new developments in technology uh, that make mining easier, uh, more effective. Um, new uh, metallurgical techniques, I suppose, uh, new alloys of metal that are uh, better for creating things out of, that are that more are structurally sound, more durable, maybe more, uh, and what's important here is the mine, because what's interesting about a mine is that you're underground. <laughs> Shoot, I completely lost my train of thought. What's, what's important is that you're underground. And what's important about being underground is that you have no sunlight. Uh, you're in this weird 
sort of nonsense world, this dark place where all you can really do is labor at things. And in Mumford's mind, the the mine and the factory are connected. They're, they're like brothers. Because in both of them, you sort of enter into this dark, um, inhuman world and are sort of at the whim. I, keep, I don't know I'm still doing that. At the whim of these sort of inhuman... Uh, problems, I guess. I mean, it, the machines are incredibly dangerous in a 19th century factory, uh, and they're very powerful, and there's very little safety uh, procedures, and same in a mine. Uh, sometimes they just collapse, sometimes they flood. There's all sorts of uh, terrible things that can happen. And when you're submerged underground all day, and you're working in the dirty you know, terrible conditions, either underground or in a factory, covered in silt, covered in, in coal, covered in, you know, dirt. The world around is, is full of smoke and smog. Um, what you end up with is a very uh, maldeveloped individual or a group of individuals. You know, humans do not thrive underground. And they don't thrive in a machine factory. And that these people are almost stunted in their development, that they don't have the ability, you know, the leisure, which is related to, to the capitalist production system, which I'll get to in a second, but they don't have the leisure, they don't have the ability to feel um, uh, comfortable with nature, to be a part of nature, and they don't have the leisure or the ability to even sit back and ponder or do anything. Um, they end up drinking, gambling, rollicking, and causing much mischief. And this isn't the fault of, of the people, it's just they've been put in this insane environment and they've, you know, taken there as children and just spend their whole lives in these terrible, you know, dark places. Now the other factor here of the Paleolithic period is the development of capitalist production. And Lewis Mumford does not focus necessarily on capitalism in the way that Karl Marx does, but obviously it's going to be a factor here, but it's one of several factors. Obviously, in his mind, the mine, the factory, the structure of machine production, or that uh, level of industrial production, is going to be terrible no matter what system. You're, you're using. Uh, if people are made to spend their lives working in these kind of conditions, their, their lives just aren't going to be good. That's it, you know. And also, in his eyes, I mean, he's, he's also a, an architecture role critic, and he sees the whole period as incredibly ugly. These huge, massive um, sort of iron structures that are incredibly actually inefficient because um, people didn't understand the, uh, the sort of physics behind it. They over, um, overcompensated and made them just sh too bulky, way more bulky than they need to be to actually um, maintain their, their structure. And so you get these huge um, iron stru structures that are incredibly ugly, incredibly overdone. I mean, this is going to be a sort of subjective aesthetic uh, judgment, but he, he thinks the whole time is just really ugly and dumb, really. But this isn't to say that we want to go back to the Eolithic period or anything, because the um, machine production model, he thinks, is, is in incredibly important and can be used in the future because obviously we have the ability to create so many more things now than we did before and we can um, satiate I suppose people's needs in, in, in a way better way than we ever could before in terms of clothing um, there are also developments in agriculture 
uh, developments in, you know, just producing furniture and blankets and pillows and things like this. You know, just the things that people need, we can produce them much better because we have billions more horsepower than we did previously. Um, however, the, the structures, the sort of profit-making structures of capitalism where the, the focus on profitability uh, is holding it back. And we'll get to this in the Neolithic period, which is in fact where we're going right now. Now the main issues of the Paleolithic period is incredible inefficiency. Uh, and the reason for this inefficiency is partly due to technological immaturity because the new way of technological thinking is that the development of more horsepower or more raw power is the answer to technological problems. And one analogy that Lewis Mumford got from someone whose name I don't remember that he mentions a couple times is you know, if you have this one ton object, right, and you have it just sitting on the ground and you want to move it, if you want to move it, um, just push it, you need like something like 900 something kilograms of force or whatever the number was. You need a lot of force just to push it. However, what you can do if, if you want to be smart about it is, you know, you can put wheels underneath or you can put it on a surface on top of logs or something to push it. You can do these various things that uh, the most efficient way of actually moving this, if you're putting it on wheels and rolling it across a flat surface, it takes, you know, less than a tenth, like a fiftieth or something. It's like 20 kilograms in the example he used like a 50th of the amount of horsepower to do the exact same thing. It's all about the way um, that you've developed the environment, I suppose, uh, to make it possible. A, just a, a system that uses the energy more efficiently is, is what he's talking about. And the machine production system, the capitalist production system of the Paleolithic period um, was not made in that way. It basically, they saw, we have this huge amount of horsepower now, so let's just push things. You know, all, every problem can be solved by pushing, and if you can't push it, make a machine that pushes harder, you know? And so you end up with incredible amounts of, of waste. And one of the main differences that I forgot to mention about the Paleolithic period compared to the Eolithic period is that while water and wind, remember, was, was free, it's always just flowing, coal is expensive, or rather it costs money. So every time you're running it, the uh, engine that powers for the production, it's costing you money because you are expending a resource that you've paid for. And this is partially what leads to um, needing surplus labor is that every moment the factory the machines in the factory are running uh, money is being put into them and thus it's m best for the capitalists to have them running at all times and if you're having them running at all times you need people working at all times because these machines don't actually run themselves you know they need people feeding uh, feeding the ovens for the steam engine and stuff like this. <clears throat> so you need people working around the clock, and this is another thing that's sort of ruining uh, their day, <laughs> really. You need people, I mean, people are working longer hours, and they're working unnatural hours uh, throughout the night, and uh, this is one of the, the, the problems. Where were they going with this? So this technological way of thinking where you're just continually adding power is leading to inefficiencies and obviously we're starting to realize in the 20th century I think people knew this before but they didn't really want to talk about it 
you know, destroying the earth, <laughs> sending a bunch of crap into the rivers, throwing stuff all over the place, making huge landfills, and um, obviously just sending billowing clouds of smoke everywhere and making every city just gray and terrible and, and smoky and it's hard to breathe and everyone gets tuberculosis. So that sucks. You know, all that part of it is no good. And that if your only focus is on developing the power, increasing the power of the production, you're never going to solve any of these problems. And these problems are exacerbated by the technologies that are brought in by the Neolithic period. However, the new technologies of, Neo of the Neolithic period also provide the solutions if we are able to actually modify our productive systems uh, such that uh, we can take advantage of them. So the Neolithic period, we're in the 20th century now, things are moving on up, we have electricity. That's one thing that uh, very importantly did not exist. Uh, well, I, mean, it, I mean, it existed in, in small ways. We have electrical grids, we have, you know, huge amounts of electrical power. And our systems of automation, um, because of this electric power, we are a able to develop machine systems that are way more automatic than the machine systems of the Paleolithic period. I mean, just for one, you don't have to have people shoveling stuff in the oven to make the steam engine run. Uh, other things that I don't remember all the details because I'm a bit of a dumbo wumbo, but electricity, um, obviously most of our electricity actually just comes from coal anyway. But you can get electricity in better ways, which is what Lewis Mumford wants us to do. Here in BC, most of our electricity is from hydropower. That's nice for us because we have a bunch of lakes and mountains and stuff like that. That makes it easy to do that. Um, but anyway, el electricity actually works like the Eolithic stuff. You can get it from wind, you can get it from water, and you can get it from solar power, which is what many people are trying to work towards nowadays and that's a nice thing you know that's very good and that's one of the main benefits of the Neolithic period is having this electrical power the automation aspect the fact that many um, tasks that previously could be done by machines but only with the aid of, of people can now be automated. And this is, you know, after Lewis Mumford, this goes nuts with computers. So many things can be automated to the point where we don't need people involved at all. Factories can just run themselves, essentially. Um, you just need people to, to program it, I guess. <clears throat> and automation is incompatible <clears throat> with the, <coughs> excuse me, Automation is incompatible with capitalist production because <clears throat> capitalist production only works um, I mean, to the extent that it ever works in, in any reasonable way in terms of encouraging human thriving. It, it works with a specific relationship between labor and capital. And this relationship is totally thrown into whack by automation. And we see the results of this today, really, that um, people just have to keep making crazy jobs that no one wants to do just because the basis of being able to afford to live is that you have a job doing some ridiculous thing and um, if you need a job we need something for people to do a lot of things that people used to need to do they don't need to do anymore you know or can be done a million times more efficiently with the help of electronic machinery I mean just look at something like cooking or cleaning your house you know you got a vacuum cleaner that's pretty handy you got a big stand mixer that you know mixes your dough for you you don't even need to knead it um, 
you've got uh, all sorts of fancy materials, electric uh, ranges and, and such forth. And um, this efficiency is actually bad for the, um, the capitalist system. And the more efficiently, the, the less it takes to produce an item, the profit actually uh, decreases. As you're able to make more and more in something, obviously, uh, as the supply increases, the um, price eventually reaches something approaching zero. The other issue um, it, with the capitalist system is that because you're overproducing, because you're just, you know, if you're taking the capital, so let me, let me restart somewhere a bit more basic. The idea with, the, uh, with capital is that you make something, you sell it, it produces a profit, you take some of that profit, put it back into the production in order to make more during the next round, etc., etc. So you're always making more and more stuff. Eventually you reach a point where you're making too much and people don't need it. What you need to do then is find a new market. And what you do is you go colonize somewhere and cause a bunch of problems for everybody. Uh, eventually you've done all that. You've covered the whole world in a bunch of people who will buy your stuff, but they all have it now. Oops. Now what do you do? Uh, what you do is you develop uh, marketing techniques that make it so that people will want to buy things again, uh, buy things they already have, buy new versions. Um, uh, you have you develop trends in fashion, fashionable trends that mean that people will want to buy the same thing once a year because it's a little bit new. And you also create uh, items that are of worse quality so that they won't last as long, so we will need to buy it again. You create items that have so-called planned obsolescence, which we see in technology, where uh, after a few years it just basically stops working with anything you want it to work with. Um, and this is easier now with, with online systems because you can create software and upgrade your software in such a way that it makes old things not work, uh, which is a very nice thing to do if you want to sell people a new telephone every three years. And these are not um, just the product of greed or, or whatever. This is how you have to run a business in the capitalist system. And this is because the end goal is going to be profit and not human thriving. And a lot of people think, okay, well, it's always been profit. You know, every everyone's always wanted profit. They've always wanted more. It's, it's somewhat true. People always want more. I mean, you can't say that greed was invented by capitalism. What you can say is that production has not always been... Um, you, you have, the end goal has not always been profit when it comes to production. Uh, it used to be that you produce things that you need because you need them. And that might be a way that makes more sense. And so this is where Lewis Mumford ends up with what he calls basic communism. And I believe his attempt here is to sort of for, uh, separate himself from very unpopular forms of communism in America at the time, such as the Soviet Union. People don't like violent revolution. Lewis Mumford doesn't like violent revolution. It's pretty terrible for everyone involved, to be honest. And what he is trying to suggest is take a lot of this violent revolutionary rhetoric out of um, communism and just present the basic ideas here. Like I've said, these basic inconsistencies that make capitalist production inefficient and uh, terrible for human thriving. You know, people just keep having to work more and more even when there's less to do. That's no good because they can't go read a book, you know, which everyone should be doing. And uh, they can't go walk around in nature because we destroyed it all. Goodbye. That's a joke. I mean, there's a lot of nature. I mean, there's a tree just outside my window right now. So don't worry too much. But anyway, so his basic communism 
is a way of rationalizing production such that it accommodates people's needs. Um, one of the, the hilarious, uh, hilarious is maybe the wrong word, hilarious things about capitalism is that um, it can cause situations where you're overproducing a bunch of nonsense that nobody wants, and then you have huge supply chain issues for things people want, such as food to eat, and then food becomes stupid expensive, uh, whereas you can buy a TV for like six bucks. And uh, that sucks. You know, we all agree. That's pretty stupid. Uh, I feel like I'm getting lost here. Uh, <laughs> I'm just ranting and raving at this point. However, I would like to say, I think I'm going to conclude this now. I think I've come far enough that I need to conclude this because this is not a mini episode. This is uh, the longest episode of anything that's ever been produced. I would recommend everybody check out Lewis Mumford's Techniques and Civilization. I think it's a wonderful book. And um, I just love Lewis Mumford's approach to the world, which is... Describe it as it is, you know. He doesn't bring too much to it. He describes it as it is, he says, and he doesn't hearken to some past. He doesn't say, oh, we should never have done this or that. He says, okay, here's what we got. We've got electricity. We've got automation. We've got these great uh, metal alloys that allow us to do all sorts of crazy stuff. He doesn't know it, but soon we'll have computers. We'll have an internet. We'll have all this great stuff. And we can't get rid of it now. It's here. And we, didn't want to, we don't really want to get rid of it because there are many great benefits that we can get from these technologies. Technology uh, can be fantastic. It's all about the mindset. It's all about how you are using the technology, these systems you create um, around that technology so that it can be best utilized um, and best uh, encourage a good human life. And sometimes these systems become terribly outdated. Sometimes they never were that good in the first place. And that we should work as a society to develop our systems to make them more humane and make them actually appropriate to the technologies that we have. You know, with automation, there are certain ways... You know, automated production is fantastic because we don't have to freaking do anything. You know, that's great. But if you don't have the system in place to ensure that the automated production is creating uh, things that are useful for people and to make it so that people can actually use this much time instead of just needing to get another job doing something really stupid. Um, I forget how I started that sentence, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think I made the point in the sentence that you can finish the sentence yourself, however I was going to do it. But yeah, it's all about developing the systems, developing the mindset, not technology for technolo technology's sake, but technology for the betterment of the human people of which we are all um, examples of. And I like that he wrote a book about Herman Melville, uh, because Herman Melville is a great author, and uh, I like him a lot. So that's been Lewis Mumford's Technics and Civilization. Um, I didn't really have any notes for this, so I feel like I went off into nonsense land many times. But I hope you enjoyed the episode. Um, I, I really en encourage you to, to take a look at this book. It's uh, not actually that easy to find, but uh, if you can find it, You'll be a happy person, I think, and uh, you'll learn a lot, and you might find yourself agreeing a lot with Lewis Mumford. Um, this has been Balkwell's books that you've been listening to, or perhaps watching on YouTube, if you're doing that. Uh, you can visit my website at balkwell.substack.com, and I write essays that I put up every two weeks, I actually have one that will be related to this book coming out on uh, in a couple weeks, whenever it is. Maybe next week. Is it next week? Yeah, next week. Uh, you can also go there. If you subscribe there, 
uh, give me your email address and you will be notified every time there's a new essay or a new episode of Balcool's Books, which is this show right here, which you can subscribe to as well on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all that sort of stuff. It's a podcast as well as being whatever else it is. And uh, with that, uh, tell a friend if you enjoy the show because uh, that's a nice thing to do for your friend and for me as well. And that's been Balkwell's books. Goodbye.